my name is Harriet Vance Ball. I'm Associate Professor of Medicine from McMaster University in Canada, and I'm delighted to have with me today Dr. Bikim Boskert, who is a Professor of Medicine, Director of the Winter Centre for Heart Failure Research, and immediate past president of the Heart Failure Society of America. And we are here to discuss the new universal definition and classification of heart failure. Welcome, Dr. Boskert. Thank you, Harriet. Um, we're going to start off by giving you the opportunity to tell us about the rationale behind this report on the universal definition and classification. What were some of the limitations in the existing classification system? Thank you for that question, Harriet. Um, there were a variety of reasons. The first one is uh, the academic definition of heart failure, the heart's inability to meet the metabolic demands, though would be applicable to a significant proportion of patients, it probably was not relevant for most of our patients. It was relevant in advanced heart failure patients. Second reason is we did have differing definitions across societies and academic institutions, which created a bit of confusion and complexity. Third important reason, probably the most important one, is we recognize that the guideline-directed um, medical treatment strategies were not being implemented uh, in a standardized fashion. Uh, actually, we have seen a very uh, worrisome trend of no increase in guideline-directed medical therapies in the last two decades, which uh, definitely created the necessity to standardize the systems of care, which of course starts with the definitions. And finally, we thought it would be also important for our terminologies to be pragmatic and translatable to non-heart failure specialists and to our patients. So with that framework, we uh, felt the necessity between societies, namely Heart Failure Society of America, Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology and Japanese Heart Failure Society to come with a universal definition uh, as a consensus statement. Wonderful, That's, um, that, that highlights the importance of this new definition. Why don't you tell us about the new universal definition and classification system that's proposed in this document? It, uh, thank you for that question. We have four major components. The first one is starting with the syndrome definition. Now we specify the heart failure as a clinical syndrome with current or prior symptoms and signs of heart failure caused by structural and or functional cardiac abnormality, and importantly, corroborated by at least one of the following, either elevated natriuretic peptides or objective evidence of cardiogenic pulmonary or systemic congestion by diagnostic modalities. So that's the first component, which is the syndrome definition. The second important component is a revision of the stages of heart failure. The stages, as was established by the ACCAHA, categorized heart failure as stages A, B, C, D, which was widely recognized by the specialists and academicians, but was not easy to translate to uh, patients and or non-specialist uh, providers. Currently, in this document, we define stages as the following. At risk for heart failure, namely patients at risk for heart failure, but without current or prior symptoms or signs of heart failure or without any structural abnormalities, i.e. this was the former stage A. The second group is called pre-heart failure, patients without current or prior symptoms or signs of heart failure, but with evidence of either structural abnormalities or elevated biomarkers such as natural peptides or cardiac troponin in the setting of cardiotoxicity. And this was the former stage B. The third stage is called heart failure. It's a symptomatic heart failure as the syndrome definition implies. And the fourth stage is called advanced heart failure. Uh, severe symptoms or signs of heart failure at risk or with uh, requiring recurrent hospitalizations 
which is the former stage D. So in essence, the stages are very similar to the former ABCD stages, but has the nomenclature of at risk, pre heart failure, very similar to what pre cancer um, was able to establish, being able to translate where the patients are in terms of stages, heart failure, and then advanced heart failure. And the third component is our EF classification. Uh, we wanted to standardize the EF classification across the societies because there were a variety of different formulations being proposed. So the first one is the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with LVEF less than or equal to 40%. The second category is heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction with EF between 41 and 49. The third category is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction uh, with ejection fraction uh, greater than or equal to 50%. And the last component is, the last classification is heart failure with improved ejection fraction, with heart failure with a baseline ejection fraction less than or equal to 40%, with a more than or equal to 10% increase from baseline, with the subsequent EF being more than 40%. We did not call this category recovered EF because it's very rare for the heart to um, uh, truly recover no evidence of abnormality in the structural as well as functional capacity. And thus we uh, use the terminology improved rather than recovered EF. Wonderful. So you've gotten into what the proposed definition is and how it differs from the last definition, all in one fell swoop. Where do you think the role of phenotypes fits into this classification system? So there is evidence that phenotypes may be more important prognosticators than EF alone, although clinical trials have used the EF thresholds for trial inclusion and for testing the efficacy of drugs. But what are your thoughts on phenotypes? Critical. Three points about the phenotypes. First one is these broad categories are to standardize care. When we need to individualize, which we need to do for each patient, phenotypes are going to be critical, both for implementation of standard therapies according to specific etiology. Specific etiology matters. At that point, the phenotypes will provide us important information regarding the specific cause etiology, as well as specific phenotypes implying the downstream mediators and pathways that could be important targets for therapies. The second reason the phenotypes matter is the trajectory or the prognostication, which way, which path the patient is going uh, towards. This is important for the patient as well as for the clinician. The trajectory matters because the intensification of therapies will need to be done in a timely manner when we recognize patient is getting worse. Thus, the terminologies of the phenotypes will matter. For example, we in this document um, identify um, the importance of certain concepts. Rather than using per perhaps stable heart failure, we do advocate using persistent heart failure. When the symptoms still are present, but the patient is not demonstrating worsening or improvement, that is persistent heart failure. Versus somebody who currently is asymptomatic, but used to be symptomatic, we would like to call that heart failure in remission. That doesn't mean it's totally cured or uh, abrogated, but definitely implies that the in the background heart failure is there, but is in remission. So we also conceptualize the phenotypes in the context of the trajectories. The third concept is probably the newer treatment strategies. Uh, we currently approach the guideline-directed um, medical management with standard therapies, about which there will need to be further optimization according to comorbidities and phenotypes. And thus, these newer treatment modalities will need to be individualized according to patients' um, characterization, uh, the phenotypes that could be done by phenomapping or scoring. And finally, for research, phenomapping is going to be very important for unmet needs and uh, HEFBEF, dilated cardiomyopathies, where we are truly um, looking for more effective treatment strategies 
um, in both targeting the upstream as well as down, downstream mechanisms. I think for research, for registries, uh, phenotyping is going to be critical. Right. I really liked the change in nomenclature to improved uh, ejection fraction. And certainly the concept of remission uh, is questioned by studies like the trot hf trial that showed that patients are persistently at risk and probably ought to be uh, continued on evidence-informed medical therapies to prevent a relapse. Um, thank you so much for your time today. We really enjoyed this discussion and we hope that you will come back to teach us some more about heart failure. Thank you for the opportunity. It was a great pleasure, Harriet, and I look forward to future opportunities as well. Thank you. Wonderful.